Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dorian Chalmers, and I am the current president of the Minnesota Lyme Association. And I'm so glad that you're here joining us for this presentation tonight. Um, we are so honored that um, Lorraine Johnson, the principal inv investigator for My Lyme Data, is here with us tonight. Lorraine Johnson, JD, MBA, is the chief executive officer of LymeDisease.org and the principal principal investigator of its patient registry and research platform, MyLime Data, which has enrolled over 17,000 patients. She has published over 50 peer-reviewed articles on Lyme disease and patient-centered health care, including five big data patient-driven research studies on which she served as principal investigator. She has served on five federal advisory committees related to big data, patient-centered research, and patient registries. She served as the chair of the Patient Council for the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute and sat on both the steering committee and the executive committee of its big data project, PCORnet. She participated in the White House Precision Medicine Summit. We are so thrilled and honored to have Lorraine Johnson speaking for us tonight. She will speak for about 20 minutes and then we will have just 15 minutes for questions, which we would like you to put into the chat. And then I will read those questions off to Lorraine. So ladies and gentlemen, Lorraine Johnson. Yeah. Thank you for that gracious introduction, Dorian. Hello, everyone. I'm Lorraine Johnson, the CEO of LymeDisease.org and the principal investigator of My Lyme Data. LymeDisease.org is one of the oldest advocacy organizations in the nation, over 30 years old, which is a bit surprising considering that we're in California. We are one of the largest and most trusted communications network in Lyme disease. And you may receive our weekly newsletter or have visited our website for information. Many patients use our symptom checker to see if they're likely to have Lyme disease. And many use our physician directory to locate a physician near them. We also represent the patient community and government committees and panels. Our mission is to harness the power of tens of thousands of patients to improve patient care, accelerate the pace of Lyme disease research, and provide the data necessary to change public policy. We do this through communications, the My Lyme Data Patient Registry, and science-based advocacy. So today I'm going to talk to you about what we have learned from the registry data about antibiotic treatment for chronic Lyme disease. But let me start by telling you a little bit about the registry. So My Lyme Data is a patient-led research project which allows patients to pool their data to accelerate research using real-world evidence. The registry uses the same technology that the NIH uses for its patient registries. We launched the registry in 2015 and have enrolled over 17,000 patients. Along the way, we formed collaborations with academic researchers, biostatisticians, and the Lyme Disease Biobank, a Bay Area Lyme Foundation program. We have also worked with two industry partners to recruit for diagnostic clinical studies, and our data was included in a National Science Foundation Award. We have used patient registry data in six peer-reviewed studies that have been cited by over 75 other peer-reviewed publications. Our data has been used extensively to support state and federal government legislative actions and to inform advisory committees, including the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, where it has been cited over 100 times. I have personally served on the subcommittees for each of the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group sessions, and I also sit on the advisory committee of the Columbia Clinical Trials Network and was recently invited by the National Academy of Medicine to serve on their planning committee for putting together a workshop on long tail diseases, 
like long COVID, CFS, and chronic Lyme disease. And I'm really excited about that. Today, I'm going to talk about a couple of our studies that have focused on antibiotic treatment. But before I turn to the studies using the MyLyme data registry, I want to point out that we launched the registry because the National Institute of Health has funded only three grants to assess treatment response in patients who remain ill after a short course of antibiotics. And the last one was funded over 25 years ago. The NIH trials were very small. Sample sizes ranged from 37 to 129 subjects. And they excluded between 89 to 99% of patients who sought to enroll. So this was a very exclusive sample that they were using, not representative of what you would see in a clinician's office, for example. And these NIH retreatment trials and the way they were interpreted did not provide patients and clinicians with the answers they need to make treatment choices. A few years back, Rob Califf and I used to sit on the executive committee of PCORNet, the big data project of the National Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And Rob now heads the FDA. He used to explain the basic problem with traditional research this way. Randomized control trials are great, but they take too long, cost too much, and don't apply to most people. And the traditional way of doing research, which is one sequential randomized controlled trial followed by another, would take several patient lifetimes to determine the optimal antibiotic or combination of antibiotics and duration of treatment for Lyme disease. And as we know, patients can't wait. So we thought, what if we flip that around and enroll very large samples and look at treatment patients are actually using to see what works best? Michael J. Fox, who heads the Parkinson's Foundation, describes this approach clearly. The message is simple, yet it gets forgotten. People living with the condition are the experts. Patient registries turn patient anecdotes into data. As someone once famously described statistics from patient registries as patient stories with the tears wiped off. And data is important if you want to change public health care policy. Edward Deming puts it well, in God we trust, all others must bring data. When I say that information from MyLyme data has been referred to over 100 times in the reports of the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, what you are seeing is data in action. Most of the time, MyLyme data is cited because there was no other data source on the topic. No one has been collecting data from thousands of patients with a disease. And here's just one example of how important data can be. Before we launched MyLyme data, we often heard that co-infections among patients with Lyme disease were rare, but that was not what we were hearing from Lyme patients. And when we asked Lyme disease patients with, with chronic Lyme disease, whether they had a co-infection, 53% of patients with chronic Lyme disease reported having at least one co-infection and 30% reported having two or more co-infections. And this means co-infections among patients with chronic Lyme disease are not rare, they are common. So the point is that collecting data and setting the facts straight is important. Now, it may be that patients with chronic Lyme disease have more co-infections than patients with acute Lyme disease. We don't know. In fact, co-infections may be one reason people develop chronic Lyme disease. But without understanding the basic facts, we don't even know that we should be asking that question. So when we launched MyLyme data, we wanted to compile the largest database of information on Lyme disease based on what patients actually experience. And we've done that by asking over 17,000 patients to tell us how they were diagnosed, did they have co-infections, how long did it take to be treated, how effective the treatment was, and so forth. And one of the first questions we asked ourselves was whether patients varied in their treatment response. All of the NIH trials talk about average treatment effects. But why should we assume that all patients respond to treatment the same way? Is there really an average chronic Lyme patient? 
When we looked at other diseases, for example, hepatitis, we saw that they looked at how patients responded to treatment and grouped them by treatment response. Then they looked for differences between treatment responders, high responders, and non-responders to see what was different. And it makes sense, doesn't it? You want to identify the patients who become well or who are high responders and see what they did so that you can let other patients know. Does it matter if they take antibiotics or not? Does duration of treatment matter? Does the expertise of clinicians who treat them matter? And that's what we wanted to find out. But to answer these questions, you need really large inclusive samples, samples in the thousands. And the two MyLyme data studies I'm going to present involved really large samples, including over 3,500 patients who had chronic Lyme disease. And my Lyme data includes the type of patients typically seen by clinicians. To be included in the studies, you needed to be a U.S. resident who was clinically diagnosed with Lyme disease and who was treated with antibiotics but remained ill for six or more months after treatment. Because our sample is so large and inclusive, we were able to do something that the NIH trials could not do. We were able to look at different subgroups of patients. For example, patients who had chronic Lyme disease and who had improved substantially or who were now well, and look to see what they did that was different from people who did not respond to treatment. So the first thing we had to do was identify patient subgroups for a treatment response. We asked patients to tell us whether they were better, worse, or unchanged since taking antibiotics. And this type of question is routinely used by doctors when they see patients. It's also used extensively in research and is called the Global Rating of Change Scale. In fact, the CROP NIH retreatment trial included a version of this question. If the patient says that they are better or worse, we then ask how much better or how much worse. And based on the responses, we place them into subgroups. Patients who are unchanged or worse since treatment were considered non-responders. Anyone who improved was considered a treatment responders, but we were only interested in people who had improved substantially. And these were patients that we considered high responders. They reported improving moderately to a great, very great deal after taking antibiotic treatment. Now, a lot of patients who are well are not motivated to join the registry, but some do, and we looked at them too. To put it simply, we looked at three groups of patients, well patients, high responders, and non-responders. We then took our sample and divided it up into these three groups. And here's what we found. 52% said that they had improved to some degree on antibiotics. 35% said that they were moderately to a very great deal better. And these were our high responders. All other patients were considered treatment non-responders. Most of the non-responders reported their condition was unchanged. Only 12% reported their condition was worse. Note that our question asks about improvement at the time the survey is taken. And non-responders and low responders may continue to improve over time. We wanted to know how these groups are different, but first we needed to make sure that these patients had improved on other specific measurements of improvement. We were essentially making sure that patients had improved on things like fatigue severity and in their general quality of life, as well as uh, in response to our Brock question. To do this, we asked patients how much their overall condition had improved from the time they were at their sickest. Were they 25%, 50%, 75% or more better? And as you can see, 61% of high responders and 94% of patients who were well said they had improved 75% or more. They also reported that they had a substantially higher quality of life and a greater reduction in fatigue severity. So patients who are high responders or well reported improvements on the types of other measures you would expect. Now, chronic Lyme patients use a lot of different treatment approaches. 
Some use antibiotics alone, some use no treatment, some use alternative treatments only, and some use a combination of antibiotics and alternative treatments. We wanted to know what types of treatment patients who are high responders or well were using. And here's what we found. This chart shows the percentage of patients who reported using antibiotics either alone or combined with alternative treatments and whether these patients were well, high responders or non-responders. And notice that only 38% of non-responders report taking antibiotics. That's the gray bar at the bottom there. 59% of high responders and 76% of patients who are well report taking antibiotics. So this suggests that being on antibiotics matters in terms of having a better treatment response. The next question we looked at was whether treatment duration matters. Are patients who are well or high responders treated longer, shorter, or the same duration as patients who are non-responders? And as this chart shows, most non-responders report being treated for less than a month. So that's over on the left-hand side. You see the gray bar there is 33%. In contrast, 63% of high responders and 90% of well patients report being treated for four months or more. And most were treated for more than a year, 37% of high responders and 71% of well patients. And all of this suggests that longer treatment durations are more effective. And another of, uh, a number of other clinical studies, and these are by doctors Danta, Stricker, and Cameron, have shown that patients improve with longer treatment durations. Now remember that the NIH treatment trials did not extend beyond 90 days of treatment. So these real world results from myeline data here are important because they suggest that 90 days may be far too short a treatment duration to meaningfully improve patient outcomes, at least for oral antibiotics, which most patients in my Lyme data are on. And also, remember when I said the non-responders might become responders with more treatment, those 33% on the left represented by the gray bar had only been treated for less than a month at the time they took the survey. If they continue on treatment, they may improve. Next, we wondered whether the experience of the treating clinician played a role in how patients improved. And we found that patients who were well or high responders more often were being treated by LLMDs. In fact, 75% of high responders and well patients report seeing LLMDs. But this is not surprising when you consider the amount of experience LLMDs have. So in our most recent survey, which was a clinician survey, 56% of clinicians who treat chronic Lyme disease said they had been that they had treated more than 500 patients. And it's, it's well known in medicine generally that the more experienced clinicians perform better. For example, if you need surgery, you want to find a surgeon who routinely conducts the type of surgery you need. Now I'm going to circle back to the NIH trials. We're often told that the NIH treatment trials do not support the use of antibiotics for persistent Lyme disease. But as Dr. Fallon often points out, this is not a correct interpretation of those studies. The findings of two of the NIH trials, the Krupp trial and the Fallon trial, found improvement when evaluating fatigue severity. In fact, these studies showed a significant percentage of people improved on this measure, roughly 65%. And our results confirm the, the results of these two NIH treatment trials. And this is very important. When real world evidence from patient registries like Myline data confirm the results of randomized control trials, this adds weight and credibility to the evidence. It tells us that prior positive treatment results in those two NIH trials were not a fluke, that they represent ground truth for the disease. And some of you may have noticed that 35% of the myeline data patients are high responders compared to 65% in the NIH trials. There are a lot of reasons results may vary. We use different samples, measure different outcomes, 
evaluated different interventions over different periods of time. For example, the two NIH trials looked only at IV rocephin, while we looked at any antibiotics, oral or IV. Most patients in my Lyme data report being on oral antibiotics. Does this factor make a difference? We just don't know, but we want to know. And with more data, we can pursue this question. So let me sum this all up. Patients with persistent Lyme disease vary substantially in their treatment response. This means individualized care is very important. Many patients, 35%, improve substantially, and some improve well enough to consider themselves well. High responders and those who are well report higher quality of life, greater overall improvement, and a meaningful reduction in symptom severity. What these patients have in common is that they used antibiotics to treat their illness and that they use them for a long durations, typically at least four months and often over a year. They were also treated by clinicians experienced in treating chronic Lyme disease, LLMDs. Now, my Lyme data conducts observational research, which means it cannot prove cause and effect. But the fact that our results use large samples and real world evidence to confirm key findings of two NIH randomized control trials that can prove cause and effect is very important. So if you remember one thing from this speech before I close, it would be that the two NIH trials and my Lyme data show that for many patients with chronic Lyme disease, antibiotic retreatment works and should be the first tool in the kit for patients to get well. So bringing this to an end, the use of patient data in the MyLyme data studies is critically important. It complements other research approaches and accelerates the pace of research. We have enrolled over 17,000 patients. The more patients participate, the more we learn. Our goal is to enroll 20,000. Here's how you can help. Simply visit mylymedata.org to enroll and encourage anyone else you know with a disease to enroll. A lot of people who get well from Lyme disease just want to get on with their lives, but they have a lot to teach us. So please encourage anyone you know who is well to enroll also. That includes people who never progress beyond acute disease. We have a lot of people in our registry whose current stage of disease is acute. And let me close by saying patients need to come first in chronic Lyme disease. Patients acquire real power when tens of thousands of patient stories are transformed into the type of data that can drive healthcare policy change. Please visit mylymedata.org and enroll today. Well, thank you so much, Lorraine. Um, I have a couple of people. Um, somebody asked, what if you're not sure if you've enrolled? Well, if you're not sure if you've enrolled, you can go in and try to enroll and uh, you, you know, use it. Our, our program will recognize your email address. So if you're using the same email address that you used before, then we'll be able to match you up and say, uh, you've already enrolled. You might want to, if you've forgotten your password, we'll uh, tell you how to reset your password so that you can go back in. Perfect. Um, I just had a comment from someone also. I participated in the research a while back and I'm so glad to hear about the results of the data. That's great. It's always great to hear back from people who participated. Yeah. Um, and, and have you seen um, with this information that you've been able to supply, I'm assuming that you use some of it within your work with the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, um, have, you, have you seen any forward movement in changes in either um, medical policy or insurance policy because of it? Well, I think the last, the very last you to expect to drop will be insurance policy. What you're, tr what we're trying to do is to uh, open the door to conversations right now that haven't been happening. So when 
uh, tick-borne disease working groups come out and they say co-infections are rare, we're able to change that and say, no, they're not rare in patients with chronic Lyme disease. We're able to say how long patients with chronic Lyme disease wait to be diagnosed, what types of barriers they um, face when they're trying to obtain care and to um, set forth the results of our studies. So, I mean, we've been, we've been very successful in getting our work cited within the uh, you know, tick-borne disease subcommittee reports. And those reports are rolled up into the report that goes to Congress, everybody who's on the tick-borne disease working group, which is a lot of very influential people in healthcare policy. They read those reports, they're aware of uh, that data. And then our data is used, you know, it's used in, in state legislation, it's used, uh, you know, uh, beyond that with people working within their local governments. Wonderful. And do you have any um, other recommendations for people? Um, I'm First of all, go do my, I'm in, enroll in my Lyme data, but any other things that patients themselves can do to help promote um, moving things forward in terms of Lyme research, et cetera? Well, if you're working with, um... If you're working to change healthcare policy, uh, I would encourage you to use some of the data from my Lyme data. We've put together a couple of chart books. The first chart book that we put together was on access to care for patients. Uh, and it describes how long it takes to be diagnosed, how far patients have to travel, how difficult it is for them to obtain care, how costly care is. Uh, that a uh, chart book is available for download on our website and is a really good public policy uh, change tool. Um, and we also have another, another chart book that we just recently put out, which was based on a survey that we did of clinicians. So we wanted to find out if you were a clinician, what gets in the way of you providing care to patients with Lyme disease? And those survey results were included, they were a large portion of uh, the report that came out of the Subcommittee on Access to Care this last session. And they described structural barriers such as, you know, clinicians who treat Lyme disease can't really participate in a regular insurance network usually because they may be targeted. Many of them have uh, faced um, medical board actions or other you know, professional repercussions from treating Lyme disease. Um, and you know, getting those types of facts out there is just really important because it's one thing to be able to say, oh, I see this happening. I know this is happening. It's another thing to be able to say, we surveyed 155 clinician and, clinicians and here's what they told us. You know, now you've actually got something that has uh, some weight and some credibility in it in order to be able to shift the needle on um, healthcare policy locally, you know, or statewide, or even at the federal level. Wonderful. Uh, love the study. Thank you. Does the data allow distinguishing primarily neurological presentations of chronic Lyme from main, mainly joint pain and associated symptoms, et cetera? And is there any possibility that patients might be able to search the data themselves for correlations among symptoms, specific treatment pro protocol successes, et cetera? So that was two questions. Yeah, <laughs> it was from one person, yeah. So the first one was, yes, we do distinct, we ask patients what their symptoms are. We ask about 12 symptoms and uh, those patients are, those symptoms are easily grouped into neurological versus musculoskeletal symptoms. So we're able to do that pretty easily. Um, we, uh, do not allow, we do not provide the data uh, to patients at large. It's really, analyzing the data is really highly complex. It's, uh, I, I mean, I work with a biostatistician and I work with academic researchers when we go to analyze data. It's an extensive process. Just cleaning the data is an extensive process. So uh, I think that, that we, won't, we don't expect to be having that data be available to patients to search on their own. There's a lot of um, understanding that goes 
into the questions that we ask. I mean, for example, we ask patients to tell us how many days in the past 30 days have you spent half a day or more in bed? And that question comes from the CDC. Uh, it's actually, there's a lot of general population data that can be used with it, but you have to understand the question and the context and, um, and whether patients are understanding the question when they respond. So there's just an awful lot of expertise that goes into understanding patient responses and understanding which questions are working and which ones are not working. Uh, another question, Do, did you only collect data on antibiotics or did you also collect data on phage therapy for Lyme? We collected, it, it, it's an interesting process. We collected data on antibiotics and on alternative treatments. So on alternative treatments, if you go to our website uh, and you look under my Lyme data viz, my, my Lyme data viz, you'll find I have a blog there where I present results of different portions of the data analysis we've done. And so we, we have made public the results that we found uh, for, for alternative treatments. Alternative treatments are, are complex. Uh, we, I think we ask about 12 different alternative treatments. The most successful ones were ones that were herbal protocols. So a lot of herbal protocols um, have as a component that they work in an antimicrobial fashion, meaning they work very much like antibiotics. Um, so the, the, the alternative treatments that were rated the highest were uh, um, you know, herbal protocols and the ones that were rated the least effective was stem cell therapy. Good to know. It's an area. It's an area we're really interested in exploring further. Um, you know, for example, we know that the antimicrobial, um, you know, herbal treatments seem to be having an effect. Uh, we'd really like to know which ones. We know there have been studies that have been more recently on, um, you know, specific types of and uh, of herbal protocols that are more successful. Uh, or that are found to be successful in the Petri dish. And we'd like to start asking questions about those. And those are things that we have on our agenda to do in phase three of the MyLime data project. Wonderful. Well, I think we are getting close to coming to a close here with your questions. Um, I, we truly appreciate you being here. I know that you have worked tires, tirelessly for such a long time, Lorraine. And so from all the people who are involved with the Lyme community, we thank you for your commitment, for your hard work, and all of the things that you have established um, through your own journey. So thank you so much. I truly encourage everybody out there to go sign up for My Lyme Data, um, make, your make your experience part of the, the research. So it's, it's one of the things that you can do to help push things forward. Um, and once again, thank you again. I hope everyone has a great rest of their week and um, go visit LymeDisease.org if you haven't. They do send out great newsletters with so much information. Um, they have a great website and go sign up for My Lyme Data because every little bit helps. So thank you so much, Darian. Thank you, Lorraine. It thank was you, great everyone. being here. It was great being here tonight. Thank you so much. Everybody take care and um, we hope to see you again soon.